Anniversary.net. There's a very cool video that you can take a look at. Uh, is it required watching? Are you gonna learn anything that that's really gonna accelerate your career? Probably not, but it's an interesting look back at what .NET is, what it has been, where we're at now, and what it's supposed to become with a lot of interesting people talking about uh, how they joined the team, how they got into becoming part of the .NET team at Microsoft. So I would definitely recommend you take a look at that video because it's a very interesting look back. And, and so that's the 20 year anniversary of .NET. Also Visual Studio, amazingly, is about to turn 25 years old and still very relevant and with the latest Got a, a pretty good facelift and performance boost, and then of course we have things like Visual Studio Code. So quite interesting, and uh, uh, cool to be part of something. Then in a world where everything moves very fast and we seemingly have the language and the framework and the technology of the week, we have a platform that plays a very important role in the overall system with all these other things going on around it but it's been kind of a cornerstone that's been around for a long time so I'm excited about that and it's cool to see that not just is it still around but it's actually growing very rapidly Um, so looking at the .NET timeline, of course we now have .NET 6 which was released on November 9th with the state of .NET. I get two state of .NET about that release, so those are still available as recordings, go back and check that out. Uh, we are now in this predictable roadmap or timeline going forward with the different .NET releases. So we have .NET 6 in November 21. We have .NET 5 in November 2020. Different lights. One was a general availability, one was a long-term support license. We'll talk about that uh, in one of the upcoming slides here. And we already know .NET 7 is on the horizon, will be released in November of 2022. So it's become very predictable and this plan that Microsoft had, I've not had this uh, slide up for the last two years probably in my state of .NET, so I've had this slide almost unchanged, at least the top part. And it's working out good. So this plan that Michael has of making this both predictable as well as this 
the back and forth between long-term support and general availability has been working out the way Microsoft wanted to be going really well. And we still have minor releases in between, of course, but that's the big picture. So that's, that's nice. Also, .NET 6 is available widely on Azure has been available widely on Azure uh, with the release back in November. So anything from app services to functions to static web apps to all the different regions to Windows to Linux, all of that uh, .NET 6 is just very widely available. So that has worked out good. That's, that's kind of the big message about .NET 6. We're all very happy about that and, and, and it's, it's been a, a, group, a good success story. Uh, that's highly recommended. So if you're not on .NET 6, I recommend you start adopting that. Uh, if you're not on .NET 5 even yet, highly recommend you start adopting it because it's, it's easy to adopt and it's just worked out really well. And if you're already in .NET 5, going to .NET 6 is very, very easy. Now today in this state of .NET, we're gonna focus on other things. You know, so this is just kind of part of our quick taking stock of where we are. If you want to learn more about it, first of all, the Stata.net recordings that we did around .NET 6, uh, there was two of them still available. Go to stata.net.com uh, and you can watch them for free or our YouTube channel, you could watch it for free there. Um, same with .NET 5, those things are still very, very applicable because in a way, think of .NET 6 as a iteration on .NET 5, right? So all the things that were applicable with .NET 5 are still applicable to .NET 6. Also, we did a Code Focus magazine. Uh, we don't have any physical magazines anymore. Those were very popular. They're all gone. But all that content is available completely free. I'm not trying to sell you anything here. Uh, if you just go to codemag.com slash focus you will see the dotnet 6 issue and all the content free so check that out as well the same is true for dotnet 5 we did a focus issue for dotnet 5 these are special issues we do but we are not just doing those in a vacuum, we're doing those together with Microsoft. So the content that's in there is coming straight from the horse's mouth, if you want to think of it like that. So it's the people that actually work on the features in .NET 5 and 6, writing articles about it. So uh, it's high quality content, doesn't get much better than the people actually making the stuff, writing articles about it. So all that stuff is available for free online in our mobile app. 
take a look at that, go back, watch the recordings, there's a lot of content we put out. There's also various code presents webinars that we've done that you can go back and watch. So tons and tons of content and it's all available for free. Like I said, I'm not trying to sell you anything here. Now, one of the things we got to talk about here real quick is the end of support for .NET 5. And you're going to be like, what? It just came out a year and a half ago. Why are we talking about the end of support? Well, .NET 5 was a general availability release. It's not a long-term support release. .NET 6 is, and the idea is that you will move into something like .NET 5. It's gonna be supported for a while and then the next big version is coming around and that's going to be the long-term supported version so you just flip the switch so the idea is it has to be very easy to move between dotnet 5 and dotnet 6 and that is in fact the case so you if you have a dotnet five application today as we have a lot of stuff deployed in dotnet five what we do is first of all if it runs it runs right you don't have to worry about it it'll continue running now at the same time i know that microsoft will not be deploying patches to the, for instance, the Azure deployments of .NET 5. So eventually that may become an issue. So what I do is next time I work on one of those things, like a, a microservice or a website, for instance, I just flip the switch to .NET 6. It should really be that easy. And from what we see in our own experience and what we see in the marketplace and what other people see, it is in fact that easy. I've never heard of anyone having a problem moving from .NET 5 to .NET 6. It's just you go into your project uh, you change the property to .NET 6 and then you deploy to .NET 6. The only thing that might be an issue is if you have a server that doesn't have .NET 6 on it. Uh, but then again, if you are on any of the public infrastructure, that should not matter. But even if it's not, it's a matter of installing it. So long story short, don't panic. If it runs, it runs. It's perfectly fine. But next time around, it's probably a 30 second pass to flip that switch and continue on with .NET 6. So that's worked out really well. That's the piece that I want to report here, but something to keep in mind, right? And, and this will continue to happen like this. There will be this back and forth between GA and LTS releases .NET 7 is going to be another uh, G8 release. .NET 8 in a year and a half or a little more than that will be another LTS support. And uh, the G8 uh, releases are supported. 
for it for 15 months and then the bigger ones are fully supported for three years and it keeps going on like that. And that's the plan for the foreseeable future and it's worked out really well. Now talking about .NET 7, .NET 7 Preview 1 just became available. Uh, I think literally like three or four days ago, Microsoft dropped this. Uh, so you can now download .NET 7 Preview 1, run it in Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, uh, the preview versions of that. Uh, so that's interesting, right? The next thing is already around the corner. You can get the preview. What's in that? Well, that's going to be the topic of another state of .NET or two or three, I'm sure. But there's some interesting stuff there. Uh, there's more stuff around containerization. Uh, we'll talk about that later in this presentation today as well. Containerization is an important topic. And Microsoft's aiming to make that even easier. Currently, if you're building Docker containers, if you're deploying the Kubernetes, it's very well integrated in Visual Studio. So you download the container, the Docker tools. You, know, you then use Visual Studio's features to build to that. You may have to do some manual crafting of the Docker files, that type of stuff. And it's not terribly hard, um, but it could be easier. It could be an experience where you don't even have to download the Docker tools and keep them up to date and all of that. And so that's one of the things that is a big focus of this new .NET 7 release. There's also a lot around WebAssembly. Blazor has become a very popular web development tool. So that's another thing that I can report on that it's working out pretty good. Uh, we see a lot of interest in that. Um, and of course, one of the ways of running Blazor is towards WebAssembly, and Microsoft has been improving that considerably. Now, what is that if you've never done anything with that? WebAssembly is this binary standard that works in all browsers. It's almost like being able to run assembly code as a standard in all browsers. This is not a Microsoft thing. This is available in every browser that's out there. And so with Blazor, Microsoft has made a .NET version that builds for WebAssembly and then runs native .NET code in WebAssembly. And, and that's a big theme going forward as well. And it's not just for browsers, but it's also just WebAssembly at its core. How do you build .NET 
that runs on WebAssembly, and that could become very, very interesting over time for things like IoT devices. So instead of running a full browser with the UI elements as well, it's more just taking the WebAssembly foundation that runtime environment basically and then deploying that without the rest of the browser into device so that could be very very interesting as that opens up a whole new world of iot and other things and that's another theme of .NET 7, so that, that sort of stuff. Uh, but there's a million other things as well. First, there's improvements everywhere in .NET. Performance and this, that, and the other. We'll talk about that at length. It's an interesting release. It's not gonna be, you know, uprooting everything again. It's gonna be very compatible going forward in a gradual fashion. But lots of cool new stuff coming. So it's not like Microsoft is leaning back and relaxing with what they have achieved. So here's a link where you can Take a look at what's in there and uh, and check that out and I'm sure we'll talk about that quite a bit going forward. <clears throat> Let me see if there's any questions online. Um, We'll talk about, I, I see there's a number of questions that we'll, we'll address those towards the end of the presentation. But let's move into the main part of, uh, of our presentation here today. Let's talk about what makes project successful what we see is working in the in the wild and and what the characteristics are and in fact that's how I want to start out what are the characteristics of successful projects and as a, as a in my role as the chief software architect at code, my role is often to take a look at projects and then see are they set up properly, are people be able to work on it productively, are we on a path that will make the project successful? And what are the main things that I'm looking for there? And it often surprises people because there's a lot of things that you would think are important for a successful project that to me are kind of second fiddle. They're not totally unimportant as such. You still need to take care of those things. But they're not necessarily the make or break things. So what are the things that I have seen that are true make or break characteristics. Well, one of them is you need to be productive. Uh, it's kind of an obvious thing, but the way the project needs to be set up is you need to be able to work on the project productively. 
if you have an issue where from day one your success vector is way too shallow and you are only operating at 50% the speed or 25% the speed and productivity that you thought you would have, obviously that is going to have huge ramifications at the end. Then lack of productivity is probably the number one killer. When I think about, well, what sinks the ship, right? Is it the fine architect or is it the testability? Well, all of those are important things, but I've never seen a project fail because it it only had 80% test coverage and not 100. However, I have seen projects fail time and time again because it's not productive enough. I've seen projects that were very well architected that did a very good job at a lot of things, but the team just couldn't move fast enough, couldn't move uh, in a way that kept up with the business requirements. And then it doesn't matter how good your architecture is and how well tested your project is. If you are not being productive enough, that will sink the ship. The project needs to be learnable. If you have a project that, you know, I have a, a team of 20 people and three of them work very productive because they learned everything that is to learn, but you have no good way to bring on other people and teach them. It's not learnable like that. Again, that will sink the ship because if your project ever gets in trouble, you don't have the option to just add more people, bring them in, split the project. Now I understand that you can't just make a project successful and move productively by putting twice as many people on it. Nevertheless, I will say that that old wisdom that we've had for years in software development, that you can't just add more people, is not totally true to the same extent anymore. It's still true, but not to the same extent. Because in a world where we have microservices, where we split things out more and more, where we have potentially different client technologies from mobile to web to desktop applications to IoT devices, where we have components uh, like AI, Projects have become more splittable. So I find it's a little easier than it was. It's still not easy, but it's a little easier to add more people as long as the project is learnable 
And as long as the project has characteristics where the people that learn how to do it then become productive. Uh, the project needs to have an architecture that's capable of adjusting and compensating for problems, essentially. I've never seen a large software project that wasn't hard. I've never had see have seen a software project where there wasn't hardships that had to be overcome. I always say a successful software project is one where you address the hardships early and figure out a way forward. It's not about pretending you're not going to have those problems. You can plan all you want. There's always going to be the, the twists and turns and unexpected changes and people become unavailable and, and just problems that arise along the way and you will have areas where you take shortcuts and your architecture needs to be able to adjust to that and compensate for that and in a way make up for it later so for instance if you have proper microservice architecture, you have a composable app where you have many different pieces of microservices and you have UIs and other systems that interact with those microservices. Well, if you then have problems in those microservices and they don't scale very well, or, or you took shortcuts and there's a lot of smelly, dirty code in there, as long as you have that architecture with proper separation, you can go back and fix those things later. Because they become islands that are individually fixable and you thus give yourself the freedom to make some mistakes and, and fix some things later. If you have an architecture that's much more interwoven and everything depends on everything and there's no proper separation uh, and you don't have a proper boundary between your microservices and, and whatever calls that, well, then it gets difficult because now as you rip out those services and replace them with the thing that really works or you go from uh, a simple app service to a, a Kubernetes system with multiple containers to scale properly. Well, if you don't have that proper separation in there, those shortcomings will sink the ship eventually. So give yourself an architecture that allows making mistakes and still be successful. That to me is, is a huge piece that saved my bacon so many times. And, and when you know how to do that, that's actually um, not that hard to do. It's mainly about separating 
separation of concerns and having uh, loosely coupled individual pieces. So that's important. Now this is one that's kind of like, well, that's obvious. Uh, you need to deploy the technologies and techniques that match the problem that needs solving. What does that mean? Well, it means that as a software developer and architect, part of the skill, if not the most important skill, is knowing what to use when. I've already used the term Kubernetes, I've used the term Docker, Docker Swarm. Uh, containerization is important. But do you really need that? That's an interesting question. Some projects will. And then it's important to understand those things and every developer at this point, I think, should have an understanding of what containers are. But does that mean every single project needs them? No, I take as an example, the code magazine infrastructure. If you were in this uh, webinar, you've probably been to the Code Magazine website or our training and event website or the SEDA.net website. And that website is powered by a fairly large number of microservices on the back end. Do we deploy them as containers? No, we haven't. They're simply deployed as Linux app services. Why? Because it turned out that Linux app services were the most cost effective way to run this. And the scale at which we are at and, and thanks to the performance of .NET 5 and 6 and, and the lightweight nature of a lot of those things, it scales really well just with that. And we did go down the Docker and Kubernetes route uh, in, in the test scenario, even for that infrastructure at some point. And it would have turned out that it would have been more expensive, much more infrastructure needed more complex to deploy. We would have needed somebody dedicated to making that process work. And we'll probably go down that route at some point in our architecture absolutely supports that. But it turned out that in this case, deployment-wise, this was the most cost effective and, and, and still very scalable way to go. And in fact, moving from a Windows to a Linux backend environment to Linux app services that .NET Core uh, I think we did it first time with 3.1. Literally cut our bill uh, into, well, not even half. I think it's like a third of what we used to pay. So understanding how to evaluate that and deploying the thing that matches 
was a huge part of the success of that project. But again, keeping your sanity, right? The overarching theme that we have today. So, these four bullet points to me are among the most important. Make a project that's learnable, employ the things that you really need, make sure you can be productive and give yourself room for error. If you have those four bullet points, I think your project will be very successful. To me, one of the things I always like to keep in mind is with, with this productivity point, the right thing to do needs to become the most obvious and the most easy. That's to me as an architect, the overarching guideline that I employ to everything. I try to set up projects where the right thing to do becomes the obvious and the most easy thing to do. I try to put processes and tools in place where you don't have these scenarios where you say, oh, well, it would really be better to do it this way, but I just don't have the time. I need to get this done. Like, make the right thing the easiest thing to do. Create tools, create processes. And if you can't do that, there's probably an issue there, right? So that's been a guideline that served me really, really well over time because your team will automatically do the right thing and build uh, better. And then allowing yourself to make mistakes. And also, it needs to be productive for people that learn what they're doing. It's a horrible characteristic if you have to spend a lot of time teaching people and then even once they know what to do, they are not as productive as they should be. And unfortunately, I have to admit, many modern problems have this characteristic. Uh, for instance, we do react development, and, and this is true for many of the HTML front-ends uh, frameworks. Uh, you spend a ton of time just keeping package references up to date and so on. I've always been very critical of that. Now it's hard to get away from that in, in those environments. Uh, you probably, if you're doing Angular View, React, any of those, you will spend a considerable percentage of your overall project expense and time on people just updating package references, making sure things compile. They come in in the morning, pull the latest uh, source base, and all of a sudden something doesn't work anymore and then you spend an hour trying to fix that and then at the end of the day you go, well, now it's all up to the, I don't even know why it didn't run, but you still 
spend that time. That to me is a horrible characteristic of projects that have been very um, critical of that in many cases. And I try to steer clear of that as much as I can. That to me is one of the biggest ways of making projects successful. And I understand you won't always be able to do it, but, it, but making an effort in that direction to me is, is very important. Um, now what about these other points? You will say, oh, there's all this important stuff you need to consider. Your project needs to be testable. Your project needs to be scalable. You want to get reuse, whether it's code reuse, component reuse, uh, mindset reuse, architect reuse. You want to employ all these best practices. I'm not saying those are not important. They're still very important. Uh, but it's a second level of importance to me. I have never seen a project that failed because we didn't have enough reuse. Yeah, we may have had to scramble, we may have had to do a lot more typing than we wanted, we may have had an extra 10% of work or 20% of work that needed to be done because we didn't reuse components as much as we could have and and we look back at the project at the post-mortem and it said next time we do better next time we'll we'll start with a better architecture that allows us to have more reuse or we we start with better architecture that's more testable and we'll get much better test coverage from the get-go. Uh, or scalability. We may have started out and, and the product wasn't scalable and there was more work that needed to be done. But if we give ourselves the leeway to make some mistakes because of proper boundaries, those are things that are fixable. I've never seen a project that had the plot pulled because it wasn't reusable enough. I've never seen a project that had the plot because it wasn't testable or tested enough. I've seen hardships because of those things and we had to fix it. So I'm, I'm still saying this is an important secondary thing. And there's many projects where testing is a perfect example. We, we have a project right now that we work on for a bank. Well, we don't want to go through a, a deployment of banking software that potentially approves loans automatically and stuff like that. Uh, that isn't tested properly, right? We, we do need to have testability and to have testability needs to be built in from the get-go. It's very hard to just 
add that later if you have never thought about testing. But at this point, I'm assuming that most people have that in their mind a little bit, right? So you, you're creating software that's fundamentally testable. And then you may struggle adding more. So yes, hardships exist, but I've never seen a project completely fail because of that reason. But I certainly have part, uh, seen projects fail because they were not productive enough, because you couldn't move new people on it, they weren't learnable enough. The fundamental architecture meant that people shot themselves in the foot so badly that they couldn't recover from it, right? So take my prior slide as here's the top level of important stuff. Take this slide as this is the second level. Um, of important stuff. Okay. Uh, so here we have some connectivity issues. Uh, got a little bit of a low bit rate and OBS going. Uh, don't really know how to start and stop it. I don't think we can do that. So I guess we'll just have to stick it out and hope, uh, hope it gets better again. So anyway, that's kind of that slide here. Now let's also take a look at it from the other angle. And let's take a look at it from the characteristics of unsuccessful projects. What are the things that I sit there and I literally lose sleep about this stuff at night when I think about our projects that have some of these characteristics. To me, the number one problem is even after we do a lot of training, even after we put a lot of um, uh, documentation, a lot of processes in place, a lot of mentoring structures, all that type of stuff, the team just can't become productive. Um, so I see we still have connectivity problems online. I see my, Ian, I see my bit rate has gone up again. So hopefully that was the end of that. Anyway, so teams that just cannot become productive. I see a lot of teams where you have, say, seven, eight people on a team. You have the leader of the team. The leader of the team works reasonably productive, although not that great. You have another two people that can kind of follow along with that. And then you have the rest of the team and they just cannot function. And nobody can figure out why. 
the leaders feel they're stupid, uh, the rest of the team feels the project is set up horribly, and no matter how much training you do, you just cannot become productive. This. this is probably the number one characteristic of projects that we see that are unsuccessful, where people call us in, customers call us in to do project rescue. This is the number one characteristic I see, and, and I would not be surprised if a good percentage of the people that are online watching this event now say, yup, that's kind of the setup that we have. So this productivity issue is something you need to solve. It's not gonna get better. If you have this type of issue in your project, you need to take a step back and you need to take a look at everything you're doing. Are you really building value, business value, features that are, that are being pushed out and available to users, or are you just catering towards this, this project setup where you built this high architecture with all these best practices, um, but maybe they don't even need them for this project, right? So bringing sanity back to a project. Uh, you know, I see a lot of projects where even senior developers struggle. You know, this whole setup that I just told you with eight people, five of which can function, those five people in many cases are still very senior developers. Uh, it's a very, very common scenario. Things that should be common, things that should be used a lot are not easy. That's a horrible characteristic. Right, you're setting up a project and everything you do is just hard. You're, you're adding another microservice operation, another method essentially. The potential is relatively simple data access or, or some very simple business logic. And building that is not hard, right? It may be a, a 20 line operation that takes you literally five minutes to build, but putting it all into place takes three hours because the whole pipeline, the whole infrastructure is just so complex. And, and then you try to run it and you have no good way to run it and, and you trigger certain things, but the infrastructure is such that everything can go wrong in the middle and you don't really know why and then it never comes out the other end and your code is never triggered and you're like well it took me five minutes to write this and, but now a day has gone by and i'm still not sure it works that is horrible Right, you need to make sure that very common things you do a lot, uh, 
those things need to be easy and, and doing the right thing needs to be easy. Uh, I've also seen this a lot, uh, where typically here, here is what happens. You do a project and it went reasonably well, but it was kind of a death march and you got it done, but you're like, next time we do it all better. And then you look at that and you pull, put all the stuff in place because one day that will be a huge benefit. Uh, putting all the stuff in place, so if you ever have to go to a different database, it will be easy. If you ever have to add this, it will be easy. If you ever have to scale it, we are already there. We already made the stuff that scales really well, even though we don't need it yet. This nebulous future benefit I have never seen come to fruition in 30 years of software development.